Hello and welcome to another world famous video from the Word of God Ministries explaining whole Bible Christianity. I'm Bruce Bertram. God's gracious law is a perfect gift with a number of benefits attached that we also call blessings. We will talk about three of them in this video out of a total of 24 in all the videos in this series. These are not the only blessings but they're a good cross-section. We get benefits when we get the law. God's purpose is to bless, and His law has tremendous blessings. Some only get a few benefits because they only accept a little of what God has to offer. But if we plunge in with whole hearts, we will gain the approval of our Father and reap a full harvest of blessings pressed down and overflowing, just like the Rechabites we talked about in the first video of this series. So the first blessing we'll talk about in this video is that it teaches children. I was talking to a guy from Voice of the Martyrs uh, magazine at my church a few years ago. He was there with a speaker warning of the danger of Islam. We got into a discussion because of the tassels on my pants. Um, you can see chapter 10 or you can see our videos. This is what I wear. He was familiar with some of the concepts in our book and these videos on the positive portrayal of the law and he made an interesting comment. He said we, the church, are losing kids in the inner cities to Islam because of the attraction of discipline. Islam offers a discipleship method that is more structured than Christianity or conventional Christianity or churchianity and uses parts of God's law. Many of our youth have become tired of floating in an endless sea of subjective sentiment. Our culture has cut itself loose from too many anchors. Islam is attractive to the kids because it provides structure in an unstructured world. You might think this is merely anecdotal and not proof that something is wrong in the church. But it illustrates that youngsters are looking for more than what the watered-down church is offering. Following God's ways doesn't guarantee a lack of problems, but it certainly works better than man-made rules or drifting aim aimlessly in a shifting sea of ever-changing feelings. In my opinion, God's instructions are way more effective than the ones we make up. God desires of us godly offspring, and the most effective way to raise them is to teach His laws in word and in deed, as it is written. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Malachi 2.15 Another few years ago, a good friend in the Sunday school asked how he could help keep his kids in the faith. Seems his teenagers were starting to drift away and he was concerned. I listened in some amazement as another friend took 10 minutes to advise the first friend to keep his kids from watching R-rated movies and make sure they went to church every week. <laughs> My advice was a little different. I told both friends to teach the word through God's traditions, especially the feasts. Leviticus 23. I told them how we observed Sabbath with a family meal as a kickoff on Friday night and how my daughter, who went to college in Hawaii for a while, still participated even though she was far away. She'd call on Friday nights and we'd put her on her speakerphone. Then we would say blessings and eat together. She could participate through the speakerphone. Later, her fiancé, a Marine training in North Carolina, would call too and we had to find a second speakerphone for him. We already, we already had two phone lines. It was a lot of fun and helped keep our kids involved in and connected with the family and with the Word. Of course, nowadays we'd probably use laptop computers and, and uh, video cameras, but, or video chats. But the key to this was to practice God's Word all the time, not just after they left home. I lost touch with that friend, so I don't know if he ever took me up on my advice. I hope so. Practicing the whole Bible has made a huge, wonderful difference in our lives. We still have a family meal once a week, even though my daughter and her husband have been married for 11 years now. I'm so pleased that my children, and now grandchildren, have been taught the law, and they are still following its precepts. They tell me that the word is much more meaningful to them than ever before. 
God's word is guaranteed to work because it is backed by his authority and power. We don't always cooperate ourselves, but the word works. If we follow his directions, we will end up right where he wants us. The next blessing is that the law helps us esteem God. Our culture in the last few decades has placed a great emphasis on self-esteem. We think we need to work hard on building ourselves up and feeding our egos. <laughs> the Bible, however, accurately informs us that we don't need more self-esteem. We already have an overinflated self sense of self-worth as it is. The problem is not what we think of ourselves, but how we treat God and others. We love ourselves just fine without having to bolster it or have it bolstered by others. As it is written, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Ephesians 5, um, 28 through 30. Look at all the verses. This is why verses like Leviticus 19.18 assume a love of self as a starting point for loving others. Notice, too, that lovers of self turns up in a very negative list in 2 Timothy. As it is written, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, <laughs> lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid men such as these. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. In general, people want what God has, but they do not want what God is. We want his power, his life, his blessings, and all the other nice things that he has. But we do not want him in charge of any of it. We love Psalm 23, but Psalm 119 doesn't exactly fan our flames. Magic and other practices he prohibits our self-esteem related attempts to get what God has without God. We overrate our importance, then try to use that inflated sense of self-worth to manipulate and get what we want, minus the whole sovereign God thing. Self-esteem doctrines tell us that what is important is what each person thinks or feels. They don't include what God thinks or feels. As it is written, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. 2 Chronicles 16.9 We've got plenty of self-esteem built in. <laughs> what we really need is God-esteem. Obedience to the smallest instruction from God shows our esteem. When every jot and tittle of his word, even the least command, is accepted and followed with love in the Spirit, we speak volumes about how we esteem our God. Self-esteem follows in its proper place. The next blessing we will talk about is that the law helps us draw near and touch God. One of my favorite terms, and one that comes the closest to the reason for following the law, is draw near or come near as... Uh, see Exodus 12.48. In my view, this is what Torah is all about. The term can be used for simply getting together, if we're talking about a pair or a group of people, but when one of the parties is God, it takes on a whole different character. We can come near God for judgment, as in Malachi 3.5, or we can come near in love and intimacy. A similar term is draw near, as it is written. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James 4.8 We draw near to God as we do what he says. The more we do, the closer we get. In humility, we use his living oracles to wash the parts of us that get dirty. Though he has cleansed us wholly, we still need to wash occasionally. As it is written, Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. John 13.10 We are clean, but we still need to wash some in order to continue drawing near. Excuse me. Notice that Jesus did the foot washing during the Passover meal. Jesus continues to wash our feet by the washing of the word as we draw near to him through his commands. There is a continual cleansing by his law because we are in a dirty world and sometimes we step in something odiferous 
odoriferous that needs to be removed. If we judge, cleanse ourselves, and wash our hands or feet, then Jesus doesn't have to judge us. Every time we implement another instruction from our Father, we draw near, and it is as if we touch him and he touches us. When we trust him and do what he says, like a little child, love flows between him and us and our siblings in the body. People long for a touch from God. They don't find it as often as they'd like because usually they want it on their own terms. Submitting to his law allows more of his light inside. As we abide in his word, it is like we open windows one at a time in a dark, musty house. Jews refer to a command from God as a mitzvah and liken each one to a thread between the believer and God. The more commands we do, the more threads are established and the more we are tied to him. The more threads we have, the harder it is to wander away. Besides, what's the big deal with doing what our Father says, even in minor details? A few holidays, what we eat, and some clothing choices don't seem like all that huge of an issue, do they? No, they aren't. What does make a difference, a big difference, however, is our attitude about God's Word. Either it is all important or none of it is. We can't get all mystical about Christ lives in us and then ignore the things he commanded us, at least not and have an effective walk with him. If we keep making excuse after excuse to dodge his word, we will miss out on life and that more abundantly. We will also continue to present a hypocritical and cracked up picture of our father to others. We end up driving the rest of the world away from what they desperately need also. As we obey each command, we touch our Lord and Master and friend, and he touches us. From this flows worship, thanksgiving, praise, and testimony to his provision and blessed love. It is no big deal to incorporate all of God's requirements for holy living because he doesn't ask very much of us. As our Father, of course, he's not going to leave us hanging after making us new creations. <laughs> He shepherds us with tender loving care, making boundaries and warning us away from dangerous situations. So thank you for watching. We've got more videos and a website at www.wholebible.com with a draft of our book, Whole Bible Christianity. Subscribe to our channel, please, and register on our blog for a continued conversation or give us your comments below. Shalom.